<clears throat> My name is Rick Smalley. I'm a professor at Rice University. Well, a number of years ago, actually, it's getting to be quite a number. It's about 19 years ago. We discovered a new form of uh, carbon, which is um, resembles a geodesic sphere, which we um, named after Richard Buckminster Fuller, the the uh, uh, popularizer of geodesic domes, and we called them fullerenes. The the most uh, the archetypical one is a perfect soccer ball shaped molecule, about a nanometer in diameter, all made of carbon, hollow object, very strong. Uh, but it turns out that it was just the harbinger of an infinite new class of carbon materials, all with the same geodesic motif made of hexagons and pentagons. By far the most interesting one, a member of the infinite new family of materials, of carbon geodesic materials are what we call Bucky tubes, elongated tubular structures uh, made of carbon, all primarily hexagons along the tube, but capped at either end in a half of a buckyball. And uh, those tubes now uh, are pretty much our total obsession in our research uh, because they are, well, nanoscopic in, in two directions, uh, just the, the width of the tube is only a nanometer or two. So a nanometer is a, a billionth of a meter. It's about the diameter of a DNA double helix. Um, but it, along the tube length, it could be any length. In fact, we've made these things uh, several inches long now. Um, and they turn out to be the strongest fibers you will ever make out of anything, about 100 times stronger than steel. And in addition to that, they conduct electricity uh, in fact, uh, in a way that's unrivaled by any other conductor we've ever discovered. So, in fact, we're making transistors out of these uh, tubes, individual tubes carrying billions of amps of per square centimeter current and outperforming any uh, silicon or gallium arsenide transistor ever made. We have a new project now to make what we call the armchair quantum wire, which will be a wire, kind of like a fishing line, um, made out of a particular kind of these bucky tubes called the armchair tubes, which are metallic conductors. And we expect these, uh, these wires to have a conductivity greater than copper at one-sixth the weight, and tensile strength of steel. Um, and as you start putting these huge currents along them, they don't get longer and sag down like our current power lines. They pretty much stay the same length or to a certain extent actually tighten up. And uh, as we develop the technology to make these new wires, uh, initially we'll make small amounts of them, mostly for NASA applications. But our intent is uh, to actually use them to replace um, the existing aluminum and copper wires that you see strung around the world. Uh, you know, it sounds bold, but uh, we plan to rewire the world with these Bucky quantum wires. So that's what our research has been about over the last almost two decades. Uh, and uh, we're now actually gearing this up in a new laboratory here at Rice University called the Carbon Nanotechnology Laboratory, where we intend to get uh, really serious about this and make this all happen within a fairly short period of time. This, this research that we're doing reaches down to the nanometer scale. In fact, looking at objects uh, with our mind's eye, that are only one or two nanometers in diameter. Uh, you can't see objects like that. They're too small to see. And the best optical microscope in the world, we have one of them over here in the corner of the lab. If you looked at these bucky tubes, you'd say, Rick, it looks like dirt. I mean, it just, you just can't see them. And you can't see them because the wavelength of light that your eye is sensitive to uh, is hundreds of nanometers, so roughly about 500 nanometers in wavelength. And you just can't see objects and make out the edges um, that are much smaller than that. And yet, here our whole research is looking at things that are hundreds of times smaller. And in fact, we want to know not just roughly what they look at we like, we want to know exactly where the atoms are and how they're hooked together. 
How can you do that? You're basically studying invisible stuff. Well, modern science has for a hundred years been developing ways of doing that in chemistry and physics with new sorts of microscopes and spectroscopic techniques. Um, and over the years, I've been privileged to be right at the leading edge of this. Uh, I've been a scientist for, gee, at least 40 years now. And I've seen many revolutions come through of new technologies. So I was around when the first lasers were used. I was around when we first used computers to interface with equipment. And there's this very rapidly accelerating proliferation of, of instrumentation uh, that gives us new eyes and ears and sensors to what's going on on the nanoscopic scale so we can know with great precision just what we've done when we're not doing things right, how to change it. Uh, so technology keeps on feeding on itself. It's really quite dramatic to see this go on. Um, the rate of production of new knowledge of science in this last decade is dramatically higher than the previous decade. And it's not just in laboratories like this and nanotechnology, it's all over. In astrophysics, for example. Great, great. Okay. Question number three. Discuss why collaboration is vital for your study along with the ways it will be enhanced by technology. When I first came to Rice University and wanted to be a scientist, I kind of thought that most of my time I would sit at my desk and I'd be writing papers and be sort of a quiet guy and every once in a while I go out to a seminar or something like that. It's not at all the way my career has evolved and it's not at all the way that most scientific careers evolve. Virtually every good idea I've been involved with first came out in a conversation with another scientist or a graduate student or an undergraduate or, or came out when I was talking to an undergraduate uh, class like freshman chemistry and I had to explain to them why this particular topic actually made sense and was interesting. So the night before I had to figure out what the answer to that was. And you can imagine Rice University students at 8 o'clock in the morning, they got kind of an attitude. And they just love to point, point, poke holes in your argument and say, well, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And that's boring. And so you're forced to get into really the essence of the subject. And in the process of looking for the words to explain things in a simple, clear way, you're forced to understand in probably a clearer way than you've ever understood before. So the, you know, the awful secret of education is the only person who really learns is the teacher. And so the trick is to get the students to teach one another. Anyway, so it's a highly interactive process, uh, both from the microcosm, microcosm of just one person like me being a scientist, but worldwide, the importance of communication uh, can't be overemphasized. Take your idea that you think you understand and take a person you've never met before, explain it to them, and get them to come back at you and say, well, I don't really believe you. And that interchange refines the ideas in a way that you can't do by yourself. What about collaborating with uh, professors at other universities on specific projects? There... So we're, we're always involved in collaborations. I've written very few papers that's just my name or one other's. I mean, often we'll have papers that have 20 or 30 authors on them from many different schools. And we've collaborated with Ray Bachman, for example, at the University of uh, Texas at Dallas. We've got collaborations going with the people around the state and around the, the country and for, for that matter around the world. Uh, tremendously enabling in this is the internet, of course, email, the cell phone, uh, video conferencing. Uh, it's getting easier and easier to do this. The whole world is getting wired together in a way that uh, is tremendously enabling for collaborations. I work intimately with about 10 times as many people as I worked with 10 years ago, only because uh, you can do it by email and cell phones and so forth. That's great. Okay, one more. Describe other ways that unlimited connectivity or aggregate computing may improve your research. Well, this has been a fascinating couple of decades that um, not only has the power of computing uh, advanced by many orders of magnitude, just while I've been here at Rice University, uh, but the speed of the internet and the power of how much um, 
uh, information you can access has increased incredibly. It, Google is a great example. Now, actually in my research group just yesterday, I asked these guys to check the Reynolds number of the gas flow in that apparatus. Well, most of the kids in my, in my research group that I was talking to never heard of the Reynolds number. So my, I used to say, well, go to this book. There's the classic reference, and you'd read it. And they'd have to find the book, and I'd have to find it. I don't have to do that. I said, just go Google Reynolds. And bingo, in a half an hour, they got the full explanation of the calculated Reynolds numbers. They understand it completely. Now, you know, this is happening at a ferocious rate around the world, not only with Google, but with Yahoo. These search engines are getting to be incredibly powerful. And it won't be that long before you'll have pretty much the entire world's knowledge available, not just here at Rice University, but in Timbuktu. And six billion people will have access to the full human knowledge. That's pretty big a transformation in the human experience on this planet. Wow, that's great. I've got all I need. Is there okay. No, no, that's good enough. <laughs> Those are vacuum. instead of uh, silicon, well, nanotubes on silicon. They're, but in this case, we're not actually trying to grow, we're trying to cause nanotubes to, um, we, so we, we have a fiber of nanotubes and that, we, that another have. group makes, and we deposit catalysts on the end. Uh, uh, is that? Uh, it's, well, 